From Bronze Age kings and mythical heroes to Dark Age aristocrats and real poets. It takes 500 years, but at last, finally, the foundations of an ancient city are set. Athens. Rise. To the Athenians of the 5th century BC, it was oral and artistic tradition to ascribe the beginning of Athenian life, or rather, life as a political entity, to the mythical king Kekrops. As with numerous Athenian myths, the myth of Kekrops is attributed to what we call the Late Bronze Age period, roughly from 1600 BC to 1100 BC. It was thought Kekrops organised Attica into 12 demes, of which Kekropia, the land of today's Acropolis, was one. We know this due to the writings of the ancient geographer Strabo, or Strabo. Of the 12 cities he names, five have been securely located by archaeologists. Now, all of these places have significant Bronze Age remains, particularly from around 1400 BC onwards, suggesting a core of truth to the myth of Kekrops. Most significant of these finds are the numerous tholos or beehive tombs. These Mycenaean tombs, so called in honour of the paradigmatic late Bronze Age city of Greece, Mycenae, donate a substantial degree of wealth and authority. For the tholos is reserved solely for those with both kings, chiefs, noble warriors, and wealthy men. Largely plundered throughout antiquity, these tombs nonetheless provide signs of rich grave goods, such as a gold cup in Marathon, an ivory lyre in Menichti, and carved gemstones in Thorikos. The next important king in Athenian myth is Erechtheus, an able warrior who defeated King Eomolpos of neighbouring Eleusis. Though it took the sacrifice of one of his daughters, Euripides' play Erechtheus has Athena foretelling the construction of a temple in the titular character's honour. A temple that exists on the Acropolis to this day, there it is, and built during the age of Pericles, there he is, in the 5th century BC. Erechtheus is credited with establishing the famous Panathenaic Festival, which basically means a festival for all Athenians. And really, it's a festival all about Athenian pride, civic pride, and one that becomes all the more elaborate and important by the classical period of the 5th century BC. A generation or so after Erechtheus, and we get the most important Athenian hero, Theseus. There he is. Now Theseus is known to most of us, if at all, as the hero that circumnavigates an impossible labyrinth to slay the Minotaur of Crete. I mean, that's how I would slay a <laughs> Minotaur, no? I don't know. Anyway, to the classical Athenian, he's better known as the founder of their city, which he is said to have achieved through a Cienoicism or Cienochism coming together of the 12 cities of Kekrops into a larger political community one that offered equal partnership and one centred around the Acropolis. Henceforth, all three born inhabitants of the outlying districts or cities of Attica are citizens of Athens with the same rights as those living in its centre, basically to the south of the Acropolis. Now I've just slipped in a small crucial detail there, which is life to the south of the Acropolis. Now you see, living in the south is in stark contrast to what we know of classical Athens with its agora, the effective centre of classical Athens in the 5th century BC, and its theatres, and its, uh, what is it, the Roman agora, very close to the old agora. That seems to be where life is, and that's over to the north. So we typically thought that life started at the north of the Acropolis. But how do we know today that the original centre was to the south? Thucydides or Thucydides or Thucydides, I mean there's so many different variations, basically the bloke who's an ancient historian, one of the very first, he reports on this and once again the archaeological finds confirm it with excavations revealing far more early material south and southeast of the Acropolis than the cemeteries and limited occupation encountered in the deep layers beneath the classical agora to the north. The most significant archaeological evidence of the coming together is the Mycenaean or Cyclopean walls on the Acropolis. You can see them here, kind of in rubbles, but they're pretty big, right? The walls, originally, are about 8 metres high, and so massive for its time. So massive, in fact, that the later classical Athenians ascribed their construction to mythical giants or cyclops, big creatures with one eye. Hence the name Cyclopean. The walls are dated to around 1250 BC and indicate a massive fortification program, and so a considerable degree of power and wealth. 
The Acropolis is even kitted out with a secret water supply system designed to allow defenders within its walls to withstand a long siege. Here you go, you see the, look, that's the illustration of the well. You go all the way down. I mean, that's how it is today. Not very good, but back then, dick -dock, dick -dock, get your water, go back up, you're fine, right? That was the idea. Now, no other city or district of Attica is fortified to such an extent during this period. So that means something quite significant. Indeed, it is likely that the Acropolis of this period is more than the center of Attica. It is its primary citadel, a palace. But our evidence is primarily archeological with later occupations obscuring the record. Certainly there's no literary record. A second line of fortifications, according to ancient literary sources from the fifth century, so sources reporting on their own antiquity, they report that there was this wall, a fortification that ran around the lower slopes of the Acropolis. And this is known from several sources and inscriptions as the Pelagikon, and sometimes as the Pelaskikon. No part of this lower wall has ever been found, and it simply may not have survived the march of time. Although the Greeks of this period had a primitive writing system known to us as Linear B, there are no surviving or extant examples of this system from Attica to examine. Now this is in stark contrast to the finds of Linear B clay tablets at the sites of Mycenae, Pylos, Thebes, Knossos. I mean, we found thousands, thousands of these clay tablets. Now that goes the other way too, for unlike most other sites inhabited in the Mycenaean or Late Bronze Age period, Athens does not appear to have suffered a catastrophic destruction. Archaeologically speaking, there's simply no material evidence of this. We don't find any arrowheads in the layers or the relevant layers, no scars of fire, no earthquake cracked walls or remains of murdered and diseased humans. Certainly nothing on the scale of destruction that we find in places like Mycenae and Pylos, for example. The collapse of the Bronze Age palace system is followed by a marked decline in the population of Attica and indeed across the entire Greek world, forming what historians now call the First Dark Age. Of course, it's borrowed from what we originally think of as the Dark Age, which is to say, yes, the classical Greeks not only had their own antiquity, they had their own Dark Age and they ascribed its cause falsely to the Dorian invasion. Right, so in 5th century BC classical Athens, they are aware of some kind of destruction, they're aware that something's gone on, and their explanation is that these bloody Dorians who later become Spartans, which for the Athenians is very, very convenient to believe because they really hate the Spartans, right? They want to see them as some barbaric, idiotic lot that don't really belong to Greece, whereas the Athenians, by contrast, were of the earth. They sprang naturally from the area. They deserve to be there. The Spartans? Less so. Of course, the Spartans wouldn't accept this. They say they're descendants of Heracles, and uh, well, Heracles is as Greek as you can get. Well, you know, whatever explanation we have, and indeed I do have an episode on the Bronze Age collapse, or I touch on it, things went sour. So whatever happened, things went sour. The Dark Age is of course a redundant and problematic term when applied to the early Middle Ages, which is what it was initially applied to but it nonetheless retains some validity when applied to the centuries between the Bronze Age collapse to the Archaic Age. So around 1100 BC to 800 BC. It was truly a dark age because we have little light with which to see it. All signs of complex communal living and palace-based redistributive economies that were common in the late Bronze Age completely disappear, not just from Greece, but also the Levant and Anatolia. Indeed, Egypt seems to be the only one civilization of that period to survive relatively intact, but even then, it's never the same. For Greece, at least, there is no support system for large populations, let alone complex administrative systems of record keeping and scribe culture. Writing and reading is lost. They both disappear. There's no one to teach it, no one to provide its materiel, and no record to take palace civilization and the age of kings was over. Independent homesteads situated close to natural resources necessary for survival pop up everywhere. These homesteads were likely in constant conflict with each other given the harsh frontier-like living conditions of the age and the inevitable contest over scarce resources this would lead to. There were also alliances and clans which became the staple of the village or the Atsi and later the town or deme, which is where we get the root for democracy from. Deme is in people of a town. 
Now, being a good chief of the homestead, a good father, a leader of the Deme, meant also being a good protector. Indeed, the word for noble and good, agathon, is by the 7th century BC synonymous with aristocratic privilege, with its rights of fate, or moira, and birth, thusis. These are the so-called born to rule. Now, being an excellent agathos might mean making alliances or successfully fighting for space and resource. This emphasis on excellence is known as the Homeric standard or traditional value system of ancient Greece. And indeed, it is likely that this way of living and form the Homeric take, or Homer, the poet's take, on the late Bronze Age legends of Troy that he writes on in his epics. It's for that reason that we call this standard Homeric. You see, it really is first enunciated through Homer, through the legend of Homer the poet. Whether he was indeed one person or not, we don't know. But let's look at his actual works. We have Achilles with his hope for gilos, or glorious reputation. We have Odysseus and his battle with the suitors. And this is a Homeric hero who comes out on top of often violent and brutal contests of arms, and especially in the case of Odysseus, of wits. Achilles and Odysseus both exemplify the excellence that would be expected of a chief. So to be good is not to be a good person in our modern moral sense, where your soul and intention is pure and, well, good. It's rather to function well, to function well in relation to one's position in life, if you're a father or a leader, to function well as a protector, as a provider, to be excellent, to be an excellent elite, to be indeed the born to rule. So there's an obligation to protect and the duty to do well, to function as a good leader. Now protection also meant protection of guests. Indeed, guest host friendship or xenia was sanctioned by Zeus, so the Greeks thought. To harm a stranger or a guest is to incur Zeus's wrath. In Homer's Iliad, for example, the Greek Diomedes is preparing to battle an enemy warrior, Glaucus, only to discover that Glaucus's grandfather once hosted his own grandfather as a guest. Now, this is a distant act of hospitality, but nevertheless, it binds Diomedes and Glaucus not to fight, to honor, in other words, the friendship of their descendants. So to function well as a warrior, protector, and chief is primary, but it still comes with limits that are sanctioned by Zeus. This is a way of tempering or moderating what is essentially quite an individualistic, at least from a chief's point of view, and vicious, aggressive, and very, very competitive mentality. Take another example, Agamemnon, the king of the Achaeans, the Greeks in Homer's Iliad, does not function well when he takes Briseis from Achilles. Briseis is the, the prized womanly possession of Achilles after the first confrontation, after the first confrontation with Troy, that is. Now, Agamemnon is approached by his commanders not for having stolen Briseis from Achilles, but for having misjudged to the detriment of the campaign against Troy. You see, it's the king's right to take what he wants, really. There's nothing morally wrong with taking the woman. What is wrong is the stupidity in doing that. In taking Briseis away from Achilles, basically, Agamemnon pisses Achilles off to the point he refuses to fight. He sulks famously in his tent whilst all his comrades are slaughtered by their ships at the beach at the hands of primarily a mad, rabid, God-inspired Hector who slaughters left, right, and center. Achilles still sulks. So Agamemnon made a colossal misjudgment. If he was a good functional king, which for the most part he was, if we believe Homer, he would have not had done this. Now, what about justice? There's no justice in this world. The kind of is, justice, dike, is basically the quiet cooperation between citizens which as you can imagine is pretty opposed to their loud competition which we find in Homer. The polis was a coming together of various and powerful homesteads and that originated in the wake of the Bronze Age collapse. So inevitably corporation is involved. So what's going on here? What we're finding is Greek values in a transitional stage. You see the warrior standard of excellence in Homer is for the most part more valid for the Dark Age period that he wrote them in than for the late Bronze Age period in which the stories and poems are set. It makes sense, that is, for small communities, 
and less so for large cities. A small community to survive in the Dark Age needs a strong warrior chief, arguably. Now, it is thought that Homer, even if he is one person, composed the poems towards the end of the Dark Age. So the point is that he is projecting the values of his own society onto a distant past, which becomes quite a constant theme in Greek literature and certainly in Greek tragedy, where mythical others and foreign characters are introduced to portray the conflicts and concerns of contemporary Athens or the Athens that was contemporary for the you know tragedies at the time. But as these communities come together, this value system makes less and less sense. That doesn't mean it went away, Actually, the value system was held onto quite dearly and for quite a long time by the aristocracy. And indeed, we have to consider that Homer's poems, which were traditionally orally transmitted, would have been written down for the first time by aristocrats, because basically only an aristocrat would have been literate at the time of literary revival in between around the 8th and 7th centuries BC. So the aggressive individualism of Homeric competition suited a life without cities, and with the slow emergence of a city-state and the large communal life it necessitated between competing warrior chiefs, well, you can see this placed a great strain. This created some problems, and we're gonna see more of this strain, more of this problem, and the way it pushes the Athenian intellect to greater depths over the course of these series. In fact, the fundamental recipe for Greek civilization, if we're being frank, is conflict. So there's a Bronze Age, the age of the alleged events of Troy, the age of Theseus, the age indeed of most Greek myth. The age is one of palaces, big walled and fortified cities and warrior culture. But it ends, you know, collapses even. There are no more palaces, no more administrative centers, no more writing systems, no more heroes anymore. The population declines. People live in frontier-like conditions, out in the sticks, slowly forming towns centered on farming and run by a chief or a series of chiefs. These chiefs get their value system, their means of justification from Homer. Though contemporary of Dark Age Greeks, Homer, if he were indeed one person, writes of this age and its values through his Bronze Age characters, basically through a distant and alien people. But in that process, they are made to become very, very familiar. In the Iliad and the Odyssey by Homer, we find the blueprint of the Greek value system common to the Dark Age and later to the aristocracy. And these value systems reflect conditions of existence, certainly of the Dark Age. Now, we're still pretty far off from classical Athens, quite far off from classical Athens, but it is at this point that the basis of its democratic system, the constant fight between the cooperative democrats and their competitive aristocrats is fully set. Or really, a battle between the many and the few. And what defines Greece is not the many winning over the few or the few over the many. It's the constant back and forth, that dynamism between the two that really accentuates the democratic nature of Athens. You see, Athens, its democracy, was always fluctuating, really, between democracy proper and oligarchy. We've got many dozens in the pipeline, so stick around and subscribe. And you can really help us grow by sharing to anyone you meet, either online or in the real world. Thanks for watching until the end, well done, cheers and yes us.